So uh, lipedema and vasospastic disease, a livid association. Uh, disclosure, again, just so minimally relevant. So lipedema and vasospastic disease. I mean, you see a patient, you're a patient that has lipedema, you have enlarged legs, you go see your physician. Probably the last thing you're thinking about is telling your physician that you have cold legs and feet. Probably not top on your list of things to mention. But yet, this patient's legs are discolored and they're cold. So that begets the question, where did, why would I create a lecture on vasospasm or cold skin in the setting of lipedema? And where did the genesis for this presentation come from? Well, I gotta give the, the amazing Dr. Herbs credit for this because I'm sure a lot of you have already looked at her, at her in, um, equally amazing website where it's just replete with great information. And when I used to click on the lipedema portion, she would go through the salient features of uh, lipedema, and then she updated it a couple of years ago, and she added the following, and note what she added here, hypothermia of the skin. So that definitely piqued my interest. And so I did a literature search and promptly found essentially nothing on hypothermia of the skin uh, in lipedema, but yet I was seeing this, not infrequently when you would take the time to pay attention to it, uh, in my lipedema patients. And then I did find a, a reference in an outstanding review article published in the British Journal of Dermatology in 2009 by Langendoen and Associates, and they referenced this subtype of lipedema referred to as type Rusticanus moncor that was associated with vasospastic disease. So I did a lit search on that. About the only thing else I found, it was at least this is refreshing to see in this updated 2017 best practice guidelines on the management of lipedema, Look what I found here. The skin of the affected areas may feel softer and cooler than the unaffected areas. Interesting. So here are an up-to-date, at least somebody is referencing it. Oh, you, you get a handout of this, so you, you can look at all. If, if you don't get a handout, just email me. Yeah, right? Is that, um, don't they get, do you get power? Just email me at work. I, I'll be more than happy. Just remind me to give you my email address. I'll be more than happy to give you the PowerPoint. So back to I referenced this earlier. I found this reference to a subtype of lipedema referred to as type Rusticanus moncor. I mean, God, what a, what a mouthful. So I had to go and find the reference for type Rusticanus moncor. And look at this reference. Moncor, of course, was the author. Experimental investigations in acrocyanosis published in 1940 in the archives of dermatology and syphilology. The journal's not around anymore. And uh, when, you, when I went and teased out the three cardinal features of this type Rusticanus moncor, they were as follows. Number one, more serious complaints at a younger age. Number two, dull spontaneous leg pain, worse at the end of the day, suggestive of venous insufficiency, but without varicose veins or reflux. And I would submit to you it's probably because loss of the veno-arterial reflux and nerve problems. That's gonna become a recurrent theme here. And then finally, Moncor referenced erythrocyanosis curum polarum. Let's break that word down. Erythrocyanosis, red-blue. Curum, Latin for legs, and polarum, girls and women. So there's our 1940 reference, realizing that there was an association between lipedema and vasospastic disease. And so then, of course, I had, I had to find out, well, where did this term erythrocyanosis curum polarum come from? Well, this went back to 1925, and as far as I can see or tell, lipidine was not even recognized in 1925. And when you pull this article, what Klingmuller uh, stated a, a couple of salient features of erythrocyanosis curum polarum. Number one was, this was a variant of acrocyanosis, acro meaning at the ends of your extremities, cyanosis blue, with cushion-like swellings of the legs. Occurrence common in girls and young women, risk factors, short skirts, and obesity. I mean, this was a 1925 reference. But regardless, what do you think Kling Muller was describing? He was describing lipedema. I thought that was just an amazing find there. So that's probably the first reference I could find. Uh, and not only did he describe lipedema, he was describing the association of vasospastic disease in the setting of lipedema. So I gotta hand it up or give it up to Dr. Klingmuller. Etiology, don't know about this. Greatly developed layer of fat protects the internal organs but exposes the skin above it to the effects of cold. 
But I like his clinical examination. This was, this was amazing. Erythrocinosis may extend from the inner thigh and knee to the ankle. It's a livid bluish discoloration of the skin separated by a blurred edge. In other words, it's not sharply demarcated, which I think you already saw in that first picture. And the iris phenomenon is positive. And so I want you all to do an iris test, and we'll go over this in just a second here. So let's go over some uh, examples of uh, cutaneous vasospasm in the setting of lipidema. There's our lipidema patient. If you were to palpate, her legs are quite cool. And this is very subtle. I'm starting off with a subtle example. There's just a little bit of a red-purple hue to that patient's skin. And then you look at, the, again, you see these patients are coming to see about swollen legs, and yet if you look down at those feet, there's a little bit of a red-blue discoloration. It's subtle, but it's there. And if you ask the patients, are your feet cold, they always shake their head, yes, I have incredibly cold feet. So this would be what's termed acrocyanosis in the literature, and this is a little bit more obvious, and that fits Klingmuller's initial description of discoloration extending from the inner thigh down to the ankle. Great example of, and again, the, the collective term we use for this is acrocyanosis, but really, it really is more uh, accurately described as erythrocyanosis, because it's not frank cyanosis you would see like this patient here. You can see here that color there, which is very characteristic of an erythrocyanotic lipedema patient. It's a combination of red and blue, somewhere in between. So what about this iris phenomenon or croak sign that was referenced all the way back in 1925? Croak, by the way, was a, a French physician. It was a colleague of Dr. Raynaud, for all you know about Raynaud's phenomenon. And what you can see, the, the iris phenomenon is when you take, your, take a finger and you blanch the skin. First of all, you see that pronounced blanching. If you don't have vasospastic disease, you shouldn't really see much of anything on your skin at all. You shouldn't really blanch. And then it, even if you do, it quickly fills up from below. Versus the iris phenomenon, it looks like an iris slowly closing. And could you roll the clip here of the iris phenomenon? It's, yeah, right next, okay, here we go. Okay, so it's going there. Look at that, look like an iris closing. So when you, you're done here, go home and check your feet and see if you have a, an iris phenomenon. That's always fun to do. All right, so here's another vasospastic condition that uh, not infrequently I will see in the setting of lipedema. Now you don't really see any erythrocyanosis or acrocyanosis, but you see this fishnet-like modeling of the skin. This not uncommonly complicates lipedema. Here, and this is referred to as livido reticularis. Like I said, our title is a livid association. Look at the fishnet-like modeling in that, uh, that example there. Another patient of mine with lipedema, we've got that type two predominance. I know we're trying to get away from phenotypes, but regardless, the thighs are preferentially involved. And what do you see here, which I think is interesting? The vasospasm localizes to the, to the site of fat deposition. You see the libido up in the thighs. You don't see it down in the calves. Very, very interesting. And this patient here has some modeling in the knees, but also has erythrocyanosis. So just like we get hybrid limb swelling, you will get hybrid vasospasm in the setting of lipedema. So this patient has a combination of erythrocyanosis and libido reticularis. Not uncommon. Now, so can you go in the literature and read about libido reticularis and lipedema? There's a big black hole if you look for information on this. And the only other person I've ever heard reference this is Dr. Herbs, not surprisingly. So doesn't this make you wonder, well, why does this occur? What's the pathophysiology of cold sensitivity and these cold-associated dermopathies in the setting of lipedema? Sure, you can read something on it. Well, unfortunately, there's not really much on it. But I put together some ideas that I think explain this. And this is a really good article published, you can see here, in 2014 by Cell and Associates, uh, Cell and Associates looking at the pathophysiological dilemmas of lipedema. And I'm going to encapsulate this busy slide and just say the bottom line is that abnormalities within the forebrain, specifically your thalamus and hypothalamus, lead to inflammation of the sympathetic sensory nerves and a peripheral neuropathy. In fact, this slide was entitled Neuropathy in Lipedema. Impairment at different levels of sympathetic nervous system is suggested in the background of a lipidematous neuropathy. There is a new term for you. So then you're probably wondering, okay, fine, they have a lipidemitous neuropathy or nerve damage. What does that possibly have to do with vasospasm? Well, here's the link. 
Remember that nerves regulate the tone of your vessels. They regulate the tone of the arteries. They appropriately constrict and dilate. They regulate the tone of your venules and veins at appropriate. And when they're inappropriate, you get these types of problems. So they have nerve dysfunction leading to neurogenic, nerve-related vasodysregulation. It can be manifested as color changes, such as purple, red, white. Temperature changes, usually cold, although rare instances of being warm. We'll talk about that in just a second. And even edema. This orthostatic edema that lipedema patients get at the end of the day is probably driven by a loss of the venoarterial reflux, which is neurogenically mediated. Hyperhidrosis or sweaty palms and feet, I typically don't encounter that a lot in my lipedema patients. If somebody has, I'd like to know about it. Continuing our theme here on what happens when you have autonomic dysfunction or dysautonomia, it leads to these characteristic cutaneous vascular malformations that we just referenced, atherocyanosis, which again, in the pa in lipedema patients is more of an erythrocyanotic hue. Reno phenomenon, where you actually get sharply demarcated white toes or blue toes, and then they go back to normal. That's rare, but I have seen a couple of cases of this. Livido reticularis, very common. And then finally, erythromalalgia, where it's actually the opposite of Raynaud's syndrome, where you get intermittently hot, burning red feet. And there is an example right there of one of my lipedema patients with erythromalalgia. And I met somebody at breakfast this morning that told me they actually have this. It was a good, good day of breakfast. Not for the patient, of course, but I would just, it's interesting because you don't hear this very often. And just to, to uh, continue this theme on our, our potential link between lipedema and vasospastic disease. Here's an article, uh, time's up it says, so I'm gonna have to fly through these last couple of ones. Acrocyanosis, the Flying Dutchman. This is out of the Mayo Clinic. Boy, we're gonna go through every one of these and take up your time, just kidding. What I'm gonna focus in on here is out of the causes, let's look at the heritable diseases. Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, associated with acrocyanosis. So here we have our hypermobile lipedema patient. And as you know, Dr. Erbs is the first to recognize that lipedema has recently been linked with joint hypermobility where half of these patients have a Biton score of five or greater. And the question is what percentage of these patients actually have Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome? And this specific type of Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome referred to as the hypermobile type. And as seen by this article, the hypermobile type is associated with cardiovascular autonomic dysfunction, all the manifestations that we just got through referencing. So there's the potential link right there. And when you have this article, they reference swelling and discoloration, peripheral vasoconstriction, in the interest of time, I'm just gonna go through this. And finally, the last slide would be therapy. I wouldn't treat somebody that has this. It's just reassurance that it's just an interesting epiphenomenon. It doesn't really mean anything. Try to stay warm. I wouldn't recommend vasodilator therapy for the following reasons. Hypotension, a lot of patients with lipidema, as you are aware of, actually get lightheaded when they stand up. You put them on a blood pressure medication, you get more lightheaded. Headaches, people with autonomic dysfunction get migraine headaches. You put you on a vasodilator, the headaches get worse. And then finally, your peripheral edema gets worse. So really, it's a no-drug approach when you have vasospastic disease that's having a lipidema. And my last slide is, what does this all really mean? Do lipedema patients with vasospastic disease have more edema? I think they probably do have more orthostatic edema for the reasons that we mentioned. Uh, what about their weight? I don't know about that. I don't know what to think. Leg pain? Yes, I think they do. In fact, if you remember that type Resticanus Moncor, he referenced they had a, one of those three cardinal features was an inordinate amount of pain with that subtype. So I think they probably do. And I think it is linked to hypermobility. When I see Profound vasospasm, the first thing I'm thinking of is they've got hypermobile type Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. So to be continued how this all uh, teases out, and uh, thank you for your attention.